Man. Sarah? Well, welcome everyone. We're gonna wait just a, a few seconds to let people come into the room and then we'll get started. Well, welcome and good evening, everyone. Um, we're very excited to have you uh, here for the 2022 Maplewood Ideas Festival. I'm Sarah Lester, the very proud director of the Maplewood Memorial Library. And it's great to have um, you all here and it's great to have the Ideas Festival back. And we couldn't be more excited to welcome Emma Laparouk in conversation with Hank Zona tonight. We have a great lineup this year and we hope you'll join us at the Woodland tomorrow night at 7 p.m for Dr. Joshua Sharfstein of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Health in conversation with Emily Witkowski, who's our teen librarian. Thank you to the New Jersey Council for the Arts, the Friends of the Maplewood Library, the Maplewood Library Foundation, the Women's Club of Maplewood, Words Bookstore, and the New Jersey Council for the Humanities for sponsoring our festival this year. And thank you to the creative and talented staff of the Maplewood Memorial Library for putting this festival together. We are so lucky to have so many creative, intelligent people in this town that it seems easy, but we are so grateful um, to have you here. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and um, we'll field questions after the talk. Emma LaPerouk is the food editor at Food 52 and an award-winning columnist for Big Little Recipes. Emma's debut cookbook, Food 52's Big Little Recipes, inspired by her column, is a clever cookbook featuring 60 new recipes using five or fewer ingredients. Emma lives in Maplewood with her husband and their cat, Butter. Hank Zona is a wine educator and events professional. Hank lives in Maplewood and hosts events and produces wine-related content. He has written about wine and spirits for Travel and Leisure, The Wall Street Journal, Food 52, Edible Jersey, and Jersey's Best. And you can find him on social media at Grapes Unwrapped. And now it is my pleasure to turn this over to Hank Zona. Thank you, Sarah. And it's good to see you again, too. Yes, um, you too. Uh, I've been here in, in the community a long time. Emma's been here not quite as long. And uh, so it's really great to be in conversation with her, but also to do something for the library because it really is plays such a vital role in the community here. And uh, you know, I know Emma's shaking her head in agreement as a as a writer and a book person uh, as well. So she's, uh, I, I think she's she concurs. Uh, I was approached by Robin Wallen, who I've known for a lot of years, who's been at the library, one of the fantastic people there. And she had seen a one-on-one um, -on -one conversation that Emma and I had in Edible Jersey, which, which also has uh, great Maplewood connections with uh, Nancy and Ray Painter, the, the editor and uh, editors and publishers for 15 years now. And Robin said, gee, would you like to be a part of the Ideas Festival uh, and uh, doing a kind of recreating the conversation with Emma? So I said, yeah. And Emma, again, as a fan of books and libraries and writing uh, was game too. Emma, how are you? I'm good, happy to be here. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy I'm happy we could do this. It's, <laughs> yes. um, it's kind of fun to sort of recreate our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, a book, you know, you, you, uh, you, you, put out a, you put out a cookbook. Um, it, it's a pretty cool thing, right? Isn't it, see your name on that? Yeah, yeah, it's... Um a very surreal process the like uh the physicality of it mm -hmm. um because so much of my day-to-day -day is focusing on digital and you know you're seeing it through a computer mm -hmm. um and a phone um and having something that you can flip is it's a different kind of satisfying because i think you know that was how i got into food publishing when i was a little kid was just <laughs> flipping through um all my parents cookbooks so it uh, feels very full circle it, it is, isn't it? I mean, and the Food 52 is a, a, a digital juggernaut, if you will. Uh, you know, it's 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 cram full of amazing content. It's it's a commerce site as well. Uh, you know, it, it really is everything to so many people right now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, across all different platforms, millions of hits a month. Um, but but it really is seen as a digital uh, digital outlet. Uh, and then here you are, you know, taking this this column and putting it in book form. How did, how did the column itself start though? 
Yeah, the column uh, started very shortly after I joined the company. Um, so I think I joined the company and it was like very beginning of 2018, like a few days after the year started. Mm. Um, and by the time we were rolling into spring about this time of year, actually, um, the column was live. Um, so we must have started talking about it, I would guess, within a month or two um, after I started. Mm. Um, I was talking about with people on the editorial team um, about the concept of a few ingredient column. And um, I, I joined the team as a, a staff writer and recipe developer. So my whole job was creating things and creating recipes. Mm. Um, and I think for me at that point, I was just excited about doing anything so you know the concept of having a recurring column that i could really dig my feet into mm -hmm. was so appealing um but honestly i found the concept itself very intimidating i think at the start um it wasn't like i came up with the idea and said okay few ingredient recipes are my passion and this is what i want to do here um it was more that the idea came to me and i was open to it um and it really was a a thing that I kind of had to learn along the way too, um, like with the concept of few ingredient cooking, because with digital, you're always getting feedback. There's always comment sections, whether it's YouTube or the site, um, Instagram. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, skepticism about, okay, but there, you know, what if we added garlic? What if we added Parmesan? What if I added, you know, pickled chilies or whatever it is that people, condiments that people use to kind of shows things up. Um, and I was that way too, in the beginning, I had a lot of, well, I think if I just do these three things, it's going to be bland. Or if I just did these four things, it's going to be missing that fifth thing that I really want to add. Mm -hmm. Um, so I kind of had to break that down myself for the first year, especially. It, it's, a, it's an interesting concept because at the time, 2018, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the home cooking kits are becoming really popular. Uh, there's prepared food in uh, everywhere that, you know, every supermarket's got prepared food. Uh, people are not quite, you know, it's not the pandemic where people are cooking at home. So, but you were giving, you, you were here trying to give people the option to say, you don't necessarily have to use those other sources. You can do this at home and not have it be so time and labor intensive, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that was a question that came up a lot when we were trying to figure out, you know, because it wasn't minimalist cooking is not I I did not invent it by any means. There are so many people who have done iterations of this, you know, over mm -hmm. the course of food publishing. Um, so we were trying to figure out kind of what is um, like, what's the happy place for this column? How do we make it feel? Um, very food 52. Um, and it was sort of drawing the line with those um, you know, uh, like, where does it feel like uh, we're being smart? And where does it feel like we're cheating? Um, you know, it was only um, in the, I think in the past like year that I used to sell rising flour for the first time, because we resisted it for so long, because we felt like we felt comfortable, like, for example, using bread, you know, and saying you can buy bread, because it felt like something that was so common for people to buy. But other ingredients, you know, maybe saying like buying a a fully made tomato sauce in a jar. That was where we felt like, okay, maybe this is uh, cheating the concept a little bit. So it was a lot of kind of trial and error and finding that happy space where we felt like we were being honest to the kind of things that people source and like keeping in their kitchen, but not feeling like we were constantly um, pulling like the wool over people's eyes and trying to, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, say that we were getting away with something that we weren't. Um, but yeah, so those, uh, pantry staples like condiments it's always a little bit of a blurry line that I'm always <laughs> asking myself if this feels fair so you you have a food background uh was was yes. cooking was cooking simply like this um the way you cooked I would say yes and no um I think you know I the foods that I gravitate toward most that you don't even think of as like a big little recipe. Like, I feel like those are the foods I'm most excited about. Like if mm -hmm. you just give me scrambled eggs and butter toast, like that's a perfect meal to me, but I would never have thought of that as like a few ingredient dish. Cause it just, it's always been there or like, you know, a 
PB and J or, um, you know, like that tomato sauce, it can be two ingredients in pasta and then dinner is done. Um, so I think a lot of comfort foods, um, were minimalist, but I, you know, I think important when you're, um, working in restaurants and, you know, coming up in food publishing, I was just cooking and eating everything I possibly could. So, you know, I wasn't just looking at things, a few ingredients, like I loved recipes that have 20 ingredients too. It just depends on the day. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think simple things, a lot of people, I'm very intrigued by the recipes that or the dishes that people think don't count as a recipe. Um, and that's sort of something that we've been playing around with more is publishing, like, okay, this is pasta and onions and butter. And like, a lot of people might say, oh, this is like ridiculous to even publish on a site because it's too obvious or simple. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I like those recipes that you can come back to so much that eventually like you won't even need me anymore. It's like the dating <laughs> app that you're, you're gonna delete. <laughs> Um, like I like the idea of someone making a recipe from the book or from the site and then making it so many times that like, you're not even going to open the page because it just becomes a part of your repertoire. Like, I think that's like the greatest accomplishment a recipe could make. Or it opens automatically to that page because they've yes, so that, work, they, that works too. That's even better. Um, yeah. but, but here's an interesting thing. So, so, you know, is it, is it too simple? Is it, you know, is, or is it cheating? But it's not really just about the ingredients. You're you're testing and testing and retesting. So it's really about the proportion. So it might be three ingredients, but it's, right. it's something that you really tested to get it right, not just here are three ingredients. Let's toss them all together, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you. I, I like. I really like reality TV shows, and something that comes <laughs> up a lot in these shows is when someone makes a very simple dish, mm. like that person has, like you know, they're gonna go home because it's like anything you mess up is so obvious when there's mm. nothing to hide behind. Um, and I do think that makes the testing a lot harder. Um, like I was working on a dish today that is like mostly probably gonna be tomatoes and onions, mm. um, and you know, like even I had taken like one bite and I was like, okay, the, it's too much onion. Like it's, you know, it's, it's clear that like, I'm going to need to like, uh, rejigger this ratio a couple times. Um, but it is just that when it's so simple, um, you notice absolutely everything, but mm -hmm. like, I like to think, I mean, like, you know, the nice thing with developing is that I, I worry about all those little things. And by the time it gets to the person, you know, you just have to worry about getting the two things at the market and then, you know, having a glass of wine with dinner while you cook. Yeah, test kitchen cooking is not home cooking, right? It's uh, no. you know, your test kitchen is your home kitchen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know a lot of people will tell my husband that he's like the luckiest cause he, you know, just gets <laughs> to eat all this food. But I actually, I think it's, uh, I mean, especially for the partner, I feel like it's almost worse because he's the person who like, you know, is eating the same uh, soup eight times in one week and is constantly <laughs> me feeding it to him and saying, well, it's like, you know, is this better? Is this worse? Or, you know, now it's a little too salty or it's a little too acidic. Mm -hmm. um, it's you, it really is just repetition. I think that's maybe um, something that's not as, uh, not as the glamorous part of testing is, um, you do get to make, like, I do make ice cream in the middle of the day and then I eat it for lunch and like that is the absolute best. But then the flip side is like, I, right. But like, and then I eat the ice cream again the next day and the next day and the next day. And then all of a sudden I hate ice cream for like a month because like you've just eaten uh, too much of it in one go. Um, so. Uh, on average, how many times do you think you test a recipe before you, you think you've got it? So I, you know, everyone has a different, approach with testing. Hmm. Um, there are some publications that, you know, are like developers who like pride themselves on like, I'm going to test this like dozens of times. Hmm. Um, and I have had recipes where it gets to that point, but I also, I'm like a, I like to, I'm kind of like a intuitive cook. Like I, you know, when I, I cook for fun and pleasure, hmm. I'm not measuring. I'm not, you know, obsessing over the things. Right. I'm just, I'm tasting along the way. I'm looking at it. I'm like listening to music. Um, and I think I, I try to channel that in my testing as much as I can. Um, so it's a lot of cooking as I would 
and then taking notes at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I happen to knock it out in a few, and I feel like this does taste really good, I don't think it's productive to kind of overanalyze it and over question it. Um, Cause then I think it's kind of stripping away that natural um, approach that a home cook can relate to. Um, and also, I mean, I think it's a matter of, I think I went through every year that I develop, you can kind of hone it a little bit more. Um, you know, in the past, I might've been able to kind of say, okay, well, something is off here, but I can't quite put my finger on it. And then I can't, you know, well, what is the solution? And I think the more you do it, the more you can kind of say, okay, well, it's off because it's too thick. And I know, you know, okay, well, next time I have to add more water mm -hmm. at this step. And then it, you know, you make the tests um, go a little bit quicker because you can kind of troubleshoot it. Um, a little more effectively. So it really depends on the recipe. I think it's baking recipes that end up, I would end up kicking myself with, um, cause you never really know until it comes out of the oven and then you, you know, have to start all over. You can't adjust. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can't adjust along the way, like with this right. soup, yeah. It's, it's a little more science uh, based, isn't it? Then, um, uh, and there's not that much room for creativity with the, with the formula for, for baking. Yeah. One of the great things about Food 52 is it really started as a community thing, didn't it? Really, mm -hmm. and and um, and really depended on on the feedback from from those people who really became a part of that community early on. But it still exists to this day, right? You still really rely on uh, on the people. How do you stay connected with them? Yeah, I mean, the cool thing about our site is like the, the industry term is like user generated content. Um, but, you know, we have, I think it's like well over 50,000 recipes on the site at this point. Um, mm. And most of those are from community members. Like even today, if you, you know, go to the homepage and there's like a tab at the top and you can just upload a recipe, um, you know, and so over the years, you know, it's been, there have been recipes that people have been uploading and then more and more there are um, recipes that contributors upload and work with editors. Um, but that same core that started is still there. Um, and that's, you know, I think it's like one of the coolest parts of the site is that it's this really level playing field in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, I mean, our comment sections are incredibly active. That's one of the things that like made me a fan of the site before I ever worked mm -hmm. at it. But, um, you know, a lot of uh, sometimes comment sections are kind of like you're screaming into a void. Um, but with this site, you know, it's like the editors that get in as much as they can. If like, you know, I see someone who has a question about my recipe, it's like, I want to help as much as I can. I, I love that idea that you can kind of like, it's people are like, we have a hotline too. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, someone's saying like, you know, my chicken is the oven and it's uh, like, why isn't it done yet? And then someone will respond back and be like, okay, like what temperature? And it's like, it really is this kind of in mm -hmm. real life troubleshooting. Um, and yeah. I think, I mean, in the pandemic, especially that sense of community, even though you're just in you and your kitchen day after day, that's really comforting. Um, to kind of have that sense you are cooking with friends, even though um, maybe you haven't seen anyone a week or two. Yeah, how, how does the hotline work? Is it is it online? Is it an actual phone? It's yeah, a... no, it's it's a it's like a, a page on our site. Okay. It's been there for I someone fact checked me on this, but I think it's been there almost since the beginning. And one of my favorite things about it is every Thanksgiving we staff the hotline for like I don't know eight plus hours a day like someone is on call mm -hmm. waiting for everything that comes in and like you know it's like especially Wednesday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday of Thanksgiving like week we do it the whole week but it's like um you know it's a lot of like forgot to defrost my turkey questions and it is kind of the same every year which is really funny but it's still really um it's like a very cool community moment and I almost think that um for the staffers it's like almost more special than i think it is for the people because for us you get to just feel like you're part of people's holidays in a really cool way that is that is really cool and yeah. speaking of thanksgiving we, we had this conversation the other day mm. um you know one of the questions that I, I had as we were just kind of kicking this around was um uh, was about, about the seasonality and you said you know even though you're you're getting pitches for passover and easter stories two weeks before the holiday you're already thinking about Thanksgiving. Um, yeah. You have to stay a few seasons ahead. Um, yeah. 
but that presents some challenges too, doesn't it? And like how to find certain things if you're trying to cook seasonally out of season. How do you how do you do it? It's so funny. Yeah, I I was testing some Passover recipes for the site, and it was like it was gonna be like a, a lot of food. So I like I luckily I live near my parents and my grandma, and I like texted my family, and I was like, come over. I'm making all these Passover recipes, and my mom was like, it's Passover. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 it's like not even close to Passover, but like it is for me, um, <laughs> you know, um, and I think it depends on the holiday, you know, it's like um, I was testing for my cookbook. I did most of my testing in like fall and winter, um, which was really hard for the like summer recipe development because I mean, like world we live in, like you can, I can find tomatoes year round. Right. But when I'm testing them, you have to think like this tomato tastes like nothing. And if I was making it six months from now, it would be sweet. And, you know, it would have like, you know, all these earthy notes and like mm -hmm. um, the way you end up seasoning. I had to kind of season the dish as I was picturing it tasting and not as it was actually tasting in front of me because I knew it wasn't fully representative. Um, but, you know, like we were saying, there are some things that are just hard to find year-round I mean like I think frozen cranberries like I had like to go to a bunch of stores but then I mean like canned pumpkin is available right, year-round right, right. which always yeah. surprises me because I think for me it's like such a, a fall thing like pumpkin bread but like that you can find so it's kind of a it's a crapshoot on whether you're not you're gonna get lucky and, and I need to thank you because when you mentioned Thanksgiving we started talking about sourcing ingredients and I said by the way I can't find frozen cranberries anywhere because I I do I, I think almost every month in fall, winter, early spring, I, I still roast a turkey. And then I told you, yeah, you can get fresh turkey still over at Kings and Short Hills. And I did Amazing. find frozen cranberries at Whole Foods. So thank you for the tip. I, I do appreciate that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I, the pre-conversation was good. It was helpful. I yeah, I remember finding them very specifically because I screamed in the freezer <laughs> aisle. I was so happy I didn't have to go to another store. So. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I guess that's what gets tricky, right? Is is sometimes you really spend a lot of time sourcing, and um, yeah, once you get it all, and and then you're so. So I want to go back to this test kitchen at home thing because yeah. I think anyone who's tuning in here, uh, when they hear test kitchen, they're picturing like a, a TV set, probably, right? And with uh, the cameras yeah. overhead and everywhere, and everything is white, pristine, and uh, you know, there's every every ingredient possible and every machine and implement and tool possible you you not only are testing uh in your own kitchen but you like it yeah i do i do like it i mean yeah, the funny, yeah i mean we, we are we're building out a new office right now and it's almost you know it's hard for me to uh picture that space i mean one because i haven't been there but two because mm -hmm. it's like you really do i mean it's the same thing with home cook you get comfortable with your stove and you know your fridge and you know yeah. all these weird things about um your kitchen that end up getting worked into the recipes in the way that you don't really expect. Like, you know, what is medium on my stove and what's medium on your stove? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm actually, I moved kitchens a few times with the recipes that ended up in the cookbook. Mm -hmm. And it was, all, it was so helpful because when I started retesting them in a different kitchen, things acted completely differently in a way that then you can make the recipe a lot more accurate. I mean, all of that is getting into cross testing and yada, yada, but I mean, it's, you know, I, I think being in a home kitchen, writing recipes for home cooks has so many benefits mm. um, because uh, you know, I'm the one who has to do the dishes afterward. I'm, you know, the one who's like, uh, if you, I'm asking you to take out six different bowls for one thing, like, where am I going to put that bowl? You know, it's very realistic to um, the situation that the recipe will end up in. Um, so any place that I can streamline, I'm always trying to think of that selfishly because like, who doesn't want to do one less dish or who doesn't want to take out one less thing? Um, so it has a lot of advantages. Yeah. You may have just given the best argument for big little recipes. <laughs> you know, it's, the, <laughs> it's, it's the cleanup. It's, <laughs> Which everyone, everyone dreads, right? So, um, 
So, so there is relevance. There's relevance to testing in a home kitchen because the people who are really following these recipes are, are cooking at home. Right. Uh, one of the things we talked about were, were cookbooks that, that you like and that uh, influenced you. And one of the things I think that I saw and I thought was pretty cool because we we had this conversation uh, back about the articles uh, was when you got um, this really great ringing endorsement from Dory Greenspan. Yeah, Dory is that, that must have been pretty cool too. <laughs> it, it it was I I have to pinch myself. Dory is like a total hero to me, and you know I I've loved her books forever. Um, so it was uh, yeah, it's it really means the world to get positive feedback from someone you've learned so much from. Um, and you know her books they're I mean iconic and just like any recipe in there you know it's going to work which says so much um but she also has such voice in her recipes and you know like if you read a head note from Dory you know it's a head note from Dory um and that was something that I think I really um I always try to keep in mind when I'm writing my own recipes editing other people's recipes um like how can the you're trying to share like useful information like yeah you have to make this a day ahead so like keep that in mind or you know you can use this different shape of noodle or whatever but you want it to sound like human um I think you know with our like at food 52 like the recipes we always want them to sound like people uh you know like in editing like a lot of people cut out certain words for um space or you know because it's repetitive but if I read a sentence aloud and it doesn't sound like a person talking to me um I, I find that problematic. Um, so I think she does that incredibly um, well. Yeah. Well, again, this, this is something else we we discussed back back in the fall. Uh, you are a a lover and student and collector of cookbooks. I suspect a number of people tuning in or are fall into that category. Um, you had an interesting observation. You think that cookbooks really have evolved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, cookbooks, um, I mean, I have a, I'm not the term, I said facsimile, like a, a replica of an original book, but it's not actually like a first edition. Like I have, I got one of those of like the joy of cooking. Um, so you can kind of see what it was like without, you know, paying thousands of dollars for a first edition. Um, and, you know, they're, they're so, pared down I mean like you know in a way that I think like any magazine editor would be thrilled by because you know it's like <laughs> there's nothing there that doesn't need to be there and there's so many missing pieces like oven temperatures and like there's so much um assumption made mm -hmm. um I think they were really written for people who like were assumed to have a certain knowledge of cooking um and you know there's no design element there's no photos mm -hmm. um and I think you know over the years it's i think it's just like everything about it has changed which is so interesting um because as cookbooks were changing you know there became the whole uh digital industry kind of countering it but i i feel like in that way they're they're keeping up and you know holding their own um like cookbooks can be um i think you know i've had people ask me this like why would I get a cookbook when I get, you know, thousands of recipes online for free? And I think it's such a valid question, but I think, you know, it's like cookbooks answers are, um, there are these incredible, incredibly curated collections of recipes that I think if you don't cook every recipe that I think, like they say, like people usually cook like two to three out of a cookbook that they might get. I think that's very fine. I think it's still an incredibly useful thing. Cause it's like, for me, I'll just read it like a novel. You know, I think mm. the way that um, there are essays woven in, infographics, photos that are just like, you could just like stare at it for five minutes. It's beautiful. Um, so I think like the design element and the voice and the narrative that's come in over the years is so compelling to me. Like, uh, I think if you want to learn about a place and a culture, I'm like, what better way to do it than a cookbook? Because they're becoming so research so in depth um and it's you know especially during the pandemic it often just feels mm -hmm. like traveling in a lot of ways in a way that like you might not be able to 
And, and, the, and the voices in a lot of these cookbooks are the real voices too these days mm -hmm. as well. So it's, uh, so they've, they've become very personal mm -hmm. and, um, and, and accurate, I, I guess, in their depiction. And I say this all the time because I, I put together lots of different themed food and wine events. And, and I say the best way to actually understand the culture, the easiest way is through people's palate, through what they cook and what they drink. And, um, and it's a great starting point uh, to find some common ground. So, um, so, so you mentioned Dory Greenspan. Other cookbook authors that you kind of like or uh, think are oh. doing good good work out there, or so many. I'm like appearing at my shelf for <laughs> but I mean, um, uh, oh gosh, I I love uh, Samin Nosrat's Salt Fat Acid Heat. I think I like. Uh, I felt like that book just like blew my brain into like a million pieces in a good way. Um, it was uh, that was a book that I felt like was a real turning point with illustrations mm. in um, cookbooks because it's completely illustrated, no photos. Um, mm. And it's it's just, it's absolutely stunning. And um, Hetty McKinnon, I just, I love her recipes so much. And um, her book to Asia with love, which I think came out, what year is it? It might come out 2021, 20, um, but just really, like really, really gorgeous recipes. And Hetty is a, a vegetarian but it's like you wouldn't mm. notice it um like i i read i was reading the book cover to cover and it was only like in the last like quarter of it that i was like oh there's been no meat but mm. it wasn't um it's done in such a subtle way it's not saying like oh this is a book for vegetarians it's just a book that happens to be vegetarian mm -hmm. and that's i think so many of her recipes is they're um they're accomplishing so many other things than mm. just make you not miss meat and that feels incredibly um modern to me and i feel like she does that better than like just about anyone i, I want to go back to your book um it, it's not a it's not a greatest hits of your column you, you this, mm. this was really uh, uh you went back revisited you came up with new recipes right right it, it, explain to us how you you've had this column for a couple of years and then you start working on the book tell us what the differences were and, and how it all sort of took shape yeah totally so when we started working on it we i think the the outline of the project was we could use up to like uh 50, take up to 50 percent of the recipes from the column um and i um you know one of my editors who i was working with she's like you know i always just make things harder than they have to be but i was like no way are we going to use 50 percent we're going to use like as few as we possibly can and like just about everything we pull in we're going to change it I was just like, I was, I, I couldn't, um, I was really stuck on making it feel as different as possible because there was that voice in my head. Of this, which I think is totally practical. Mm -hmm. Like people's money is precious. The things like you put in your house, it's all precious. So it's like, why would you add this thing um, to your home when you feel like you can get most of it already online? Like, I don't think that's enormous. You know, it's like, I get that. Um, so I wanted to kind of, I was like, how can we flip things on their head? Um, so, you know, maybe it was changing a cut of meat or something or changing the cheese or the technique. Um, like basically I, I retested everything that we even considered pulling and thought, okay, like, well, how can we, you know, refresh this for this moment? How can we make this, um, a little bit different, you know, in some cases, like, uh, you know, we got to have a a salad chapter, which in my column for the site, like there are very, very few salads because they don't perform well online. Um, and that doesn't mean we have no salads because I love salads. <laughs> They're one of my favorite things to make, but it's like, you know, we try to respond to what does it seem like people are looking for? What do people want? And that really, you know, shapes ideation for online publishing. Um, but with a book, you have a little bit more fun. And I felt like I, I really want a salad chapter in the book. So then you get to, you know, I get to pull some of the favors from the column, but then mm -hmm. have a lot of place to play with that. So, you know, we kind of, I just went through every single recipe that we had done to date, looked at the community favorites, looked at our personal favorites, and then kind of played from there. And then when you had that list, I could kind of slot in, okay, well, we have chicken covered maybe, but, you know, we don't have enough fish. Mm -hmm. um, fish is another thing that doesn't really do well online as much. Um, so 
it was a lot of just kind of, it felt like a puzzle in a lot of ways. I was like commuting at the time. I was always like missing my train home from Penn Station by like two minutes. So I'd be like sitting in Penn Station with my notebook for just like an hour, just kind of drawing things and trying to figure out like, uh, like what's the missing piece? What do we need? Not, not walking around Penn Station looking for food inspiration though. No, 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 just that <laughs> person in the corner on the staircase. Yeah. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of food inspiration in Penn Station these days. Um, so is, is it is it like, uh, you know, again, I was, I was just down in Margate talking with Cookie Till and, uh, and she, we were talking about her menu and she said there's things on her menu that she has had to keep on for almost 25 years because there's a, it's a, there'd be a mutiny among her customers if, if they weren't there. Did you right. find that when you were choosing recipes? Were, were there some recipes that you knew people loved so much that you felt compelled to put in the book? I think I think a little bit. I, I really was pretty firm on, I wanted, I wanted the, I wanted to be excited about everything in the book. And that, you know, like, I, I think I was a bit more adamant about that with this project because the collection is um it all is kind of bundled in whereas like with recipes that publish on their own each week you really are the concept is so important um because if it doesn't feel fresh if it doesn't feel original if it's not exciting then no one is ever going to get to the page they're not going to get to the recipe um but with the book you have a little bit more you're able to tuck it in a little bit more. Um, I think the one that comes to mind is we have a meatloaf in the book mm. and I, it was, it's such, it was, I think on the site, it's easy meatloaf and it's like, uh, you know, it's uh, beef, it's uh, ketchup, onions, very, very simple, but really nice and cozy. And I, I just, I'm not a meatloaf person. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I made it because I think, you know, we had this idea and it, it made sense as a few ingredient recipe and then people loved it. And we were like, okay, we, you know, everyone was like, put in the meatloaf, put in the meatloaf. And I really, like, I fought against the meatloaf so much, but then we ended up coming up with a different one and it was kind of this fun um, evolution. So I think that was like one of the closest spots where I was like, I, I would never cook this, but so many of our readers would. And I think that's also, um, I think that's like a really important part of, recipe development is uh like you do have like your taste matters making sure it's well seasoned and executed but um like i'm just one person and just one palate so if i only cook things that i'm really excited to eat it, it gets kind of limiting pretty fast so i do kind of have to um you have to shut that off a little bit sometimes and think okay well maybe this isn't for me but you know, it's for a bunch of people who would be super excited about it. And that makes it like an awesome thing to publish right now. Well, uh, a question that popped in my mind as we were talking, you mentioned a few minutes earlier, fish is problematic when it comes to recipes uh, in that they, people don't seem to respond to it. Is that it? Uh, is it because of price sourcing? Mm. What do you think? I think it's, I think it's changing curiously, even yeah. in the time since I started it was like, it was like almost like a joke with like um, <laughs> recipe development, but like knowing like if you publish fish, it's going to tank. <laughs> and I've noticed that in, you know, a lot of um, brands publish like these were the most popular recipes of the month or the year. And I'm seeing fish creep up more mm -hmm. and more in a way that it's very interesting. Um, but I think it's a lot of things. I mean, it's, it's expensive. You know, that's a concern. I think um, maybe some people, you know, if you don't have as much experience cooking with it, that can be intimidating. Um, and it's also, I mean, the, like I did a, um, I lived in North Carolina for a few years and I did like a seafood CSA. So it was like getting vegetables, but it was fish wow. and like off like the North Carolina coast, it was all local. And every week it was something like that. My husband and I had not never tried before. It was some variety, you know, we didn't know what to do with it. We were looking it up. We were so confused, but it was so fun. And I mean, you know, our uh, seafood, I think a lot of people just think, okay, like tuna, shrimp, salmon, and then it kind of stops. Yeah. Um, but there's so much out there. Um, but I think in that way, that can also be kind of intimidating and overwhelming. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I really like 
seafood. I like, I grew up Jewish. So like lox is like my favorite thing in the world. Um, <laughs> okay. So I, I'm slowly trying to chip away at it and get people a little more excited about it. Look, you know, we've, we've got Freeman's here in town and one of my all time favorite businesses. And even if they don't have it, they'll get it for you. And, um, yeah. and, and it's, it's great to have businesses like that nearby where there, where you can have a real personal conversation, connection, relationship with too. Yeah. And, uh, so it helps to have that. And a lot of communities don't have, even, even around here, you would think, you know, being in the New York Metro area, being near the water, uh, you think more communities would have places like this, but they don't. So, um, no, I think this is amazing. Yeah. I was yeah. just on the phone with them today. Cause I'm making, okay, this weekend I was like, can I like, can we make sure there's some tuna for me? Like if I come in Friday afternoon, yes. I was like, this is just so nice. It's like, I just, yeah, they're great. They're great. And, yeah. and there's lots of other great businesses and that's, and that's the nice thing. You grew up in the area. You grew up in Melbourne. You went to Melbourne High School, and and you moved back to the area. You still have family here and all. Um, you have some food memories from from growing up here, right? And uh, and and also some new finds that you like. Um, yeah. Tell 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 us about some of that. Yeah, I mean, I. Uh... These aren't endorsements. They're not endorsements, folks. They're just, you know, memories. And no, I'm sure. They're endorsements. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of my, my childhood memories are in like Jewish delis around the area and getting um, bagels and like those little jam butter cookies. Um, but yeah, a lot of like the, like the post preschool crowd at like Livingston Bagel, in my, in my memory, was like a very chaotic, like, club scene like it was just like the <laughs> place that everyone was at um but you know I'm like a I'm a Melbourne Deli super fan um love Arturo's um which has been here for so long but then like the cool thing is it's like you move I moved back I moved back at like almost I think exactly the time that they were opening up the bread stand yeah. um which was like connected and old in that kind of way but also brand new um so I'm like I'm very we're very much a creature I'm a creature of habit. Um, like I'll just, you know, on the weekends, just like take my walk to the bread stand, get my jalapeno cheddar croissant and a coffee. And I'm just like happy as a clam or like summit diner. I love the summit diner so much. Um, and now that the farmer's market is going to be opening yeah. back up and summit, I can get like, you know, I get my sandwich. I go like <laughs> gawk at the fruit for like 30 minutes. And then my husband has to drag yeah. me away before I buy like too much cheese for us to eat. <laughs> right. That's, uh, I, I know I try to, I, I do, I dash into the farmer's markets. I, I know what I need and I know what I want. If you spend too much time, you just never get out of there. That's, that's <laughs> the, the smart way to do it. I just, I, I get too distracted by all yeah. the pretty things. So you, um, you're testing at home. Um, you, there's a question that also just kind of popped into my head. What, tools what gadgets what what do you find indispensable in your mm. kitchen as a tester and as a cook yeah i mean i i think that's another thing where it's it's smart to to keep it in check um you know <laughs> like i i think my kitchen is like pretty like standard like i have a a blender and a food processor um you know i got an immersion blender a couple of years ago and i find that enormously useful but it's one of those things that i think a lot of people you know might not have on hand so then if you use it it's nice to kind of offer substitutes there mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean i i think i'm pretty low-key with equipment like my brother has been trying to get me uh to become a sous vide convert for <laughs> like many many years and I, I i'm resisting um i'm not an air fryer person um but you know, like maybe someday, like I got an, I got an instant pot. Um, and I, I basically, I just use it for like beans and rice and like polenta. But for those three things alone, I'm like, I I'm very happy mm -hmm. having it. Um, but you know, and also like, I mean, a stovetop pressure cooker, I was always, supposed to, I felt a little scared by it. So like the instant pot, I was like, okay, I trust you a little more than I trust me with something on the stove. So that's been kind of fun to play around with, but I, I think I'm, I'm pretty resistant to, to new gadgets. Cause I think also sometimes like these uh, appliances that promise 
everything I think they sometimes overshadow like the power of like a Dutch oven Mm -hmm. um which like yeah it doesn't have like a pretty button or a screen but like it can do a million things um so like I'm you know I feel like okay I have like some pots and like skillets and like that is going to cover me for most of it and like a knife and a cutting board yeah I mean I I, you know I think I'm the same way you know it's it's good equipment as opposed to good gadgets even even on the wine side you know I don't go crazy with glassware I finally invested in a Coravin a couple of years ago because I think it is actually a really cool thing but most of the other stuff it it is just gadgets and gadgets are are off you know sometimes there's a negative connotation to the word gadget and yeah for for a reason right so um I just want to show this page again from Edible Jersey and I want to focus in there on butter, butter <laughs> your cat, right? So, She's wandering around behind me. <laughs> here, here's the question. Here's the question I have. Is butter a help or a hindrance when you're testing recipes? Oh, I mean, it's always nice to have someone with you in the kitchen. Um, you Good know, point, she... Yeah she's sleeping most of the time but the second i i crack open like a tin of anchovies she right, right. <laughs> um you know is becomes like uh possessed by some like other spirit i mean uh, once i actually i got you know the they're like ortiz i think mm-hmm. anchovies they're yeah. like I like, I had never gotten them before because I was afraid I was going to like them too much. And then I would just buy them all the time. But I like, I was like, okay, I'm going to treat myself. I'm going to get these like really nice anchovies. And I like, I made the huge mistake of walking out of the room when after with like the jar open and like butter is like, she's a very good girl. Usually she never jumps on tables or counters, Mm -hmm. but she did jump on the counter to like try to get the Ortiz anchovies when I was not looking. And it was just like, I was so disappointed but also like impressed at the same time it was just like it was awful for both of us <laughs> Barta was showing her true self I know so, I, I did an event the Sarah, Saturday night that was a, a, a private party and it was all seafood based and they have a cat named Hank so and <laughs> one of the reasons they brought me in was because they have a cat named Hank and and Hank sat on the chair next to the kitchen counter the whole time so oh. I, t- I snapped a bunch of pictures with me and Hank the cat and she's like <laughs> Hank's never done that with anyone. I said it had nothing to do with me. It was the tuna, the scallops, <laughs> the you know, the the, the tilefish, everything else that was up there on the counter. So uh, I guess a, a cat's a cat. Um, I'm going to look and see if we have, if we have any questions. And, yeah. Uh, let's take a look at the Q and A here, and and here's one from oh from Nancy Painter. Hi Nancy, uh, from Edible Jersey. And uh, Nancy asked, uh, what's your your per- not mine? What's your personal favorite holiday in terms of cooking? Hmm. I think definitely Thanksgiving. My, my family has a lot of fun with Thanksgiving. I think in my head, I I feel like it was part of, um, with Judaism, there's so much excitement around Christmas every year, but then, you know, it's like, we're at the movie theaters and getting Chinese food. Um, but Thanksgiving was one of those holidays where I really felt like, okay, like, um, you know, like we're in it and we're doing it. And like, you know, uh, it's uh like my mom and I spend weeks planning it every single year um like obsessing over okay like well are we gonna do the same sweet potato we're gonna do a different one um and just overthinking absolutely everything but we will enjoy that um and you know I I used to um I used to work at a bakery so I would work um for like really like wild shifts for the week up leading up to it um and I think that just made me appreciate it all the more now that um, you know, not pulling an all-nighter beforehand. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just always been a very special. It, it feels more relaxing even now, doesn't it? It is uh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, folks, if you have questions, you can uh, type them in on the on the Q and A, uh, and we'll be happy to answer them. I'll, I'll kind of pick them off and and read them out to Emma and I'll even use your name if you want want us to. Uh, One of the things we did talk about last week again was was that you are kind of looking toward Thanksgiving now. You're always looking ahead a couple of seasons. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you do you see trends already for Mm. for Thanksgiving? Is there anything that's sort of um, hot and happening this year that's even though even though it's not hot and happening yet outside? I think I don't remember who I was talking about this with, but I do think Thanksgiving is one of those holidays. It's a huge challenge from an editorial perspective because you have to bring something new and something that people are going to get excited about. 
but I think at its heart, Thanksgiving is really one of those holidays that people feel so, um, tradition is so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, if you don't have your grandmother's potatoes or, you know, your aunt's corn casserole, then it's not Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like you can't really compete with that in a lot of ways. So like, I think, you know, every year there are things, you know, that are mm -hmm. fun to write about and, you know, or like a new thing that you could teach. Like I remember like uh, Bon Appetit, like wrote about a, a raw cranberry sauce one year. And that was like, whoa, like I never thought of that. And I found that very exciting. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's great for like people who want something new to find that year. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like the best you can do with Thanksgiving is like, maybe you get a, people to take a couple new dishes on their table. But I do kind of feel like I'm like, in terms of trend, it's like, it's already spoken for, you know, it's like yeah. the, tr the trend is the consistency, I think. Um, so it's more like, I'm like, okay, well, how do we um, share that in a way that's interesting and, you know, compelling again? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. You know, I, I always tell people, um, you know, consider who's at your table, right? And yeah. even from a wine perspective, too. And if you're, if you're with people who are all of a similar mind about wine or about food, whatever it is, then then you can experiment if it's a crowd that wants experimentation or you can splurge if that's it. But but if, it's, if you're sitting around a table with, with family and this is what you've done, well, then there's, there's no need to reinvent that wheel, right? It's uh, totally, it's, yeah. It's, a holiday. it's, it's, it's not, not the time to, uh, you know, I, I experiment on my family with, with Christmas dinner usually, but not with Thanksgiving. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it is more stressful if something goes wrong when 12 people are meant to be eating it. I totally agree. I think playing yeah. it safe is the smartest. So, so Robin Whalen has a question, and Robin is mm -hmm. the one responsible for this happening, or at least she's the person that's, that kicked it all off. Uh, hi, Robin. Uh, since we're here in it, uh, Emma, what is your favorite Passover dish? Um, There's butter. I know. <laughs> I'm surprised it didn't happen earlier, honestly. Um, my favorite Passover dish. Um, you know, I don't know if it could technically be called a Passover dish, but I just, I love matzo bread so much and everyone in my family does. Like we just make it all year round. I mean, like, mm. you know, you can usually get matzo if you look for it, but um, yeah, I just, I love matzo bread so much, but I guess it like maybe a traditional dish would probably be um, matzo ball soup. Like my mom, you know, just made, the best chicken matzo ball soup. And I don't, I don't really eat meat much outside of work. So now I make like a chickpea matzo ball soup if oh, I have like a, a Sunday with some time. And it's, it's very, it's very yummy. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's nothing better than just like a giant bowl of soup with a ton of matzo balls in, book? in it. Is it in the book? It's not, this it's is not. one of those recipes that I don't think I could get it to five if I like, I spent a year trying. Cause it's <laughs> just like, you know, even the matzo balls alone are probably more than five. I, li I like like packing a ton of herbs in them mm -hmm. um, and, you know, having the soup have like a ton of like big vegetables. So I feel like that's one of those like more is more situations. Is it on the Food 52 site? Do you have it anywhere? Or is this just something that's uh, tucked in? No, your I don't think so. It's one of those things that's, yeah, I just, I'll just like, you know, spend a Sunday just making like, I we have a deep freezer. So I'll just make like, mm -hmm dozens of pints of soup in one go um but yeah i don't i haven't measured it i just kind of turn on music and check out for the day cool so <laughs> you, you moved from an apartment right to your home in maplewood yeah how has that changed your cooking or has it I, changed your cooking i think the deep freezer it kind of got me like i yeah. you know working in restaurants you're very like making a portion for one person just doesn't mm -hmm. make sense. You're always making a large scale of something. Um, so I was very used to that kind of cooking, but when you don't have any place to put the leftovers, mm -hmm. you kind of can't. Um, so I think, you know, like one of the first things we did when we moved in was like go to Home Depot <laughs> and I like, you know, got my deep freezer and it was like, you know, the best like couple hundred dollars I ever spent. Cause now it's like when I make soup for dinner I you know I'll make enough well I'm just like make like eight quarts and then you just like put them in deli containers throw them down there and then you know six months later when you don't want to cook dinner like okay well we have soup um so I I'm just constantly making soup with whatever is about to go bad in the freezer so did, did they do potluck dinners at food 52 <laughs> that must be kind of fun everyone's so food focused I just imagine what it's like uh, when there's a party. <laughs> yeah, we did have, it's, it's fun having a team uh, 
meal where everyone is obs obsessed with food as you are. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's got to be, uh, it's, it's, you know, and it's it's nice to have, again, you know, that's that going back to that thing where everyone's of the same mind, it, um, then you guys can really kind of, you know, it's like when a bunch of wine people, you get really geeky, really nerdy about it. And it's, it's fun, right? It, you know, it's just someone who's not of that mind. It's, it's probably insufferable, but still when it, when it's, uh, it's true. <laughs> when, it's when, very you're true. Your, when you're with your people, it's fun. Yeah. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. So uh, any other questions? I'm trying to see. No, I'm looking for any other fresh questions out there. So, um, what's next? I know it's not another cookbook, and this is this was this is an interesting conversation, right? Because I think again, people uh, people's mind uh, when they hear, oh, she wrote a book, a cookbook. There's going to be another one because because there are authors who are like that. Uh, but you had a very different answer when I asked you that last week. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was like with um, I I always wanted to write a cookbook because I think so many people who go into food publishing always want to write a cookbook. Um, but I also wanted to write a, um, I didn't want to write, just write a cookbook. I wanted to write a book that I felt like added something. Right. Um, so, you know, I think uh, it's an oversaturated industry. There's so many books, um, so many different things that you could get. And um, yeah, I just, I feel like, you know, when the next thing is uh, right, like, you know it. And that was like, you know, how I felt with this book. Um, it was like, um, so excited about the column, so excited about the concept, like it all just really came together very naturally. Um, so, you know, I think it's like, um, what is the next thing gonna be? And like, I'm just as um, curious and, you know, also the, the cookbook process is so long. It's been like, you know, over two years, like well over two years since we started working on it. Um, so I think it's just as important to kind of like see what it's like without it and kind of get that fresh inspiration, you know, before diving into a new thing. You know, it was, it was long. I, I'm sure it's, it's, I, I, I can never write a book. So I'm sure it's long. I'm sure it's arduous. I'm sure it's, there are times where it's heartbreaking and frustrating trying yeah. to get everything to come together. But, but I think it's pretty cool. I mean, you started your column in 2018 and the book came out in 2021. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a pretty cool start to a culmination, I think. Um, yeah. To, from, from concept column, cookbook concept, cookbook, publishing, Dory Greenspan saying nice things about you and things that, and, and then of course, here we are, you know, at the, uh, at the summit here of the, um, uh, the Ideas Festival. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, having cooked all these amazing five ingredient recipes, this is from John A, can you still justify using 15 plus ingredients for other recipes? Is it still worth it? Yes, I would say a, a, a definite yes. Um, I, I think there's like a time and place for everything. You know, I think with, um, with the column and with the book, I think one of the things I was trying to accomplish the most was just showing that you can and you don't have to apologize for it. You're not making a sacrifice. Like you can just take three things and um, it's not a compromise. Like, you know, we came out with a new Big Little Recipe today. It's like a chocolate cheesecake. It's like crackers and butter for the crust, chocolate and cream cheese for the topping. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Like you're missing so many ingredients that a lot, other, a lot of other cheesecakes have, but I don't feel like, I feel like it's in my mind, I'm like, okay, this is so much better in a lot of ways because you had to put in so much less, you get just as much. Um, so, you know, I think all of that is very exciting, but at the same time, like if I see a recipe that I think looks amazing and it has, you know, uh, 14 things in it, like I'm not deterred at all um, because I think, it's like trusting the developer and the author and, you know, what's in there needs to be in there probably. And, you know, okay, maybe you could take out this or that, but like, um, you know, I think it's also fun to kind of go over the top and, you know, like I have a, a two drawers that are just filled with spices. And like, mm -hmm. if one recipe asked me to like take out 12 of them, like I'm happy to, you know? Um, <laughs> and you <but> can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's cool. Uh, can you can you look at a recipe and just know it's not going to work? <laughs> because there are some sloppy cookbooks out there, and I'm not looking to name names. But no, but no, yeah. I mean, I think I 
I've definitely had moments where I'm like, I feel confused, you know, okay, this is doing something in a way that I haven't done it before. But I also think that was sort of something that, you know, Food 52 embraces a lot, which is, um, is that home cooking mentality, like there's not one right way to do X, Y, and Z because, you know, like my mom cuts a melon one way and I cut a melon the other way. And we've had these moments where like, why are you cutting a melon like that? But it's like, it works for her, it works for me. Yeah, so it's like it, um, you know, I think, I think embracing that is cool. You know, people can like do things um, their own way and it's all good. Great, great. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't see any other questions, and I think we are supposed to wrap this up right around now. Um, people should continue to look for you on the Food Fifty Two site, correct? Uh, yes. And the, the column is there regularly. Mm-hmm. Your contributions are there regularly. Uh, if you, um, folks, if you want to find me, uh, I. I you know where to find me. Uh, um, Hank at the Grapes Unwrapped uh, is one place to find me uh, pretty easily with, uh, and I do get lots of, probably like you, Emma, you get questions at any given time of day and uh, coming from all different angles and it's kind of fun to get them. Oh wait, there's mm-hmm. one more question that popped up. Oh, it wasn't a question, it was Robin, Robin saying, thank you, Emma and Hank. Uh, thank you, Robin, thank you so much. Sarah, we're gonna, I guess we're kicking it back to you right yeah, now. Yeah, and I just wanted, that was so great. And um, uh, thank you both. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Hank. And we're so lucky to have you in our Maplewood community. And uh, can't thank wait to you. try some re- more of your recipes. And um, this was really a delight. So we really appreciate it. And um, I hope some of our audience members will join us tomorrow night at the Woodland at seven o'clock for Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, who's going to be really pretty amazing. Um, and thank you again. And everyone have a good evening and start cooking tomorrow. Thank you, Sarah. Thank okay. Emma. And support the library and support the yes. local businesses. Yes. Thank you. Bye, thank everyone. you so much. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.